You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Road. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Coming up on The Brew Review, we asked listeners to send in their spiciest deck lists and they delivered in spades. We look at 10 new brews in Modern and Pioneer in search of the next big idea. That's all coming up on Faithless Brewing. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I am David Robertson, and I am joined by the maestro of the Faithless Brewing Podcast. He is Dr. Daniel Schriever, Dan the Man, surviving in the heat in Texas. What is going on, my friend? Hello, hello, David. Good to see you again. Yeah, I'm doing well. Staying hydrated? Trying to. I mean, it's intense down here. They just Topo Chico, baby. That's what you need. Exactly. They they just found a couple of hikers who died in Big Bend from who knows dehydration or something like that. So it's it's getting real out here. You think they should have ridden a submersible down to the Titanic instead, or just <laughs> you can make bad choices anywhere anywhere in this world. <laughs> Topo Chico should have flown some, <laughs> yeah, flown some bottles out there to them. But, airlifted yeah. in there. It's the only hope. Yeah. Yeah, on a on a different note, actually, I do want to just say at the top, <laughs> in my head, the connection is, oh, there's been a tragedy in the sub community. But <laughs> I was thinking, well, actually, in the podcast community, we have a little bit of a sad moment here, by which I mean to say that Brian Gottlieb, a co-host of the Arena Deckless podcast, he's fine. He's in good health. He's doing well in life. But he's stepping down after over 300 episodes of him and Jerry Thompson over at Arena Deckless. Just for me personally, I mean, that's how I got into podcasting. That's the first podcast I ever listened to. The one that just stuck with me over all these years. And I just want to give a quick shout out, say thank you to Brian for all of the work, all of the content. Um, I'm just going to miss having your voice in my ears. I know that sounds weird, but podcasting is a little weird that way. <laughs> it, uh, it's, it's interestingly intimate in a certain kind of way. <laughs> I do think it is. I mean... I, as someone who both produces a podcast, but also listens to a lot of podcasts, I think as a listener, you, you do kind of feel like a sense of intimacy and familiarity with the people who you're listening to. Even if like, I don't share that much about my life here, but I, you know, I imagine that the people listening to this show, like feel like they know us a little bit. Yeah, it's a loss. Jerry is obviously still putting out a great show, has not revealed the new co-host yet. I'm still going to keep tuning in every week, but Without Brian, it's just not gonna. It's gonna hit different for sure. Yeah, well, we wish him well. Uh, it sounds like this was a very considered decision on his part, from what I've read. So hopefully, you know, whatever he has next is uh, is going to bring him as much satisfaction as the podcast did. Well said. All right, David, what's our plan for today? On to our podcast, where we are still here, <laughs> <laughs> still on the grind. Um, we are going to talk about. Brew Review. So we have a bunch of sweet brews drawn up by the members of the Faithless Brewing Discord, and they have submitted them to us to take a look at them and maybe offer some suggestions or maybe just marvel at the uh, ingenuity or sometimes both. Um, Now you might say, hey, how can I submit a deck to this brew review? I'm glad you asked, you know, voice in my head. You can go to patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing And you can join at the appropriate level, which grants you access to submit decks in exactly this fashion. See, the intimacy goes both ways, David. Right, Even though we can't hear the listeners, their voices live in our heads. Yes, are being projected. We hear them clearly. (laughs) (laughs) Patreon.com slash Faith is Brewing. That's where you can sign up. Uh, Help support the show. Gets immediate access to our wonderful Discord community and fun perks like the Brew Review, which... We have not done it in a while, 
But seeing the spice that's been submitted today, I'm looking forward to doing these more often. So without further ado, we can just get onto the list. We got about a, at least a dozen here. We'll see how many we can get through. Uh, we'll just churn through them and see what we got. This is a mix of some are pioneer, some are modern. And we're starting off in pioneer. So David, I'm going to defer to you here. Okay, so this first brew comes to us from Lurking Evil. I would say that Lurking Evil is one of the most prolific brewers on the Discord. This is a guy who's bursting with ideas. Uh, he's super excited to uh, try out new ideas and iterate on them. So this list is called Naya Exile Mom. And it is a deck that is built around the interaction of exiling cards, playing uh, cards from exile, and then eventually locking your opponent out. He is playing both uh, two Dranith Magistrate and two Urbrask Heretic Praetor. Um, the note he has here is that Rocco Street Chef, which is a card we've not really talked about, uh, actually plays really well with the other cards. So I think people might not be familiar with this card. It's a very unique design. So. Rocco Street Chef is a red, a green, and a white for a 2-4 elf druid. Although it looks kind of like a demon. I, I guess I'm surprised to see that it's an elf. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, whatever. It's a red, <laughs> red-skinned red elf. I, you know, I'm not here to judge anybody. Uh, at the beginning of your end step, each player exiles the top card of their library. Until their next end step, each player may play the card they exile this way. Whenever a player plays a land from exile or casts a spell from exile, you put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature and create a food token. So you get paid off every time. It's sort of like a Howling Mine-like effect. Your opponent kind of gets the first crack at it because most cards can't be played in your end step, right? So your opponent gets the first main phase. But you get paid off by Rocco every time... Um, they make use of this Howling Mine effect and they give you a food and a plus one plus one counter on target creature. So it, it's an interesting card, right? It's it's three mana for a two four. That's actually pretty reasonable. You know, it's got a big butt. It survives most of the commonly played red removal. It obviously survives stomp. Um, it's an okay blocker against mono white. And then you're hoping to accrue a lot of value when um, when you're when you're when these XL effects start to stack up. And if I'm reading this correctly, you go to your end step. So you play Rocco, go to your end step. The trigger happens. Each player exiles a card. I believe that card remains eligible even if Rocco dies. So, you know, the, the worst case scenario with Howling Mine would be that they draw a card, they draw a disenchant, and they disenchant your Howling Mine, and now you just don't get to draw a card. It's not going to be quite that bad with Rocco because you'll at least still have your card in exile that you can play potentially on your turn. So each player will have drawn one but it's still card neutral, the total exchange. And then on top of that, if they don't kill Rocco, you're getting all these benefits. What are those benefits? Well, the way Lurking Evil has put this together, it's, it's not just Rocco spitting out food tokens and plus one, plus one counters, but he's identified a cluster of cards that all benefit specifically from things going to exile, getting played from exile, or in the case of Dranith Magistrate, not getting played from exile. Yeah, so I think... I like this idea. I've wanted to fool around a lot with Rocco. So I love the Rocco part of it. I think we need to move that to a four of. Like if we're going to build around Rocco, I'd like to see four Rocco, four PNLR, four Dranith Magistrate, and four Skrelv. Hmm. Um, like I, I want to just go all in on this and, and make our way. Now, once we've upped our legends that far, I think we can play one or two um, Mox Ambers. Okay. And Mox Amber is awesome with Rocco, right? It, it fixes our mana if we can get Rocco into play. It's a cheap card to play, put into play with PNLR to trigger it. Uh, it accelerates us. So I, that's the first change that I'm thinking about just looking at this is some of these other cards are mediocre, right? Like Lovestruck Beast in this deck is not very good because we're very rarely going to be able to play the 1-1 one, one on turn 1 because we don't have a lot of untapped green in our list. Right, so Skrelv on turn one is going to be way better than that most of the time, and we do the extra ability where we get to cast Lovestruck from the from Exile and put a plus one plus one counter on Rocco, I think is 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 not worth the squeeze on that one. Agreed. So, would you also be looking to cut the Stonebinders familiar? This is the one drop that grows by plus one plus one whenever one or more cards are put into Exile during your turn, only once per turn trigger. Yeah, I'd have I'd have to think about it. Um, 
I don't. That card seems a little weak to me. The fact that it didn't make a lot of noise in standard doesn't mean it's not pioneer playable. But we aren't. I'm not really imagining this as an aggro deck, right? I don't mm -hmm. think you can play Rocco Street Chef and think of yourself as an aggro deck. So Stonebinder's familiar, um, which kind of isn't even that aggressive, is also not a great mid range card. So you know, I think I'd lean more into my four Screlves, four Dranis, four Pias, four Roccos, and I think, and then maybe like three Urbrask and the four Bone Crusher. I think that's just enough to win the game. I don't know that we need the Stonebinders Familiar. I think P is going to crap out a bunch of one ones, and Rocco's going to pump them. That's that's how I'm imagining winning the game. Yeah, that makes sense. And the Urbrask here is actually Urbrask Heretic Praetor from New Capenna, five drop. 4-4 four, four, haste. It turns everyone's draw step into an exile draw instead. So at the beginning of your upkeep, you exile the top card of your library. You may play it this turn. At the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, the next time they would draw a card this turn, instead they have to exile their top card, which they may play only for this turn. So it shuts down their main draw step is, is gone now. It's changed to this conditional draw. Um, and actually, if you have Dranath in play, it just completely shuts them out. So that's actually very exciting. Yeah, and then so the other thing I look at is Restoration of Iganjo. I've not really liked this card. It's like the Homeless Man's Fable. We're already playing four Fables, so I, I agree with that. Obviously, powerful card. I would look to play some of the Red Exile effects instead, mm -hmm. right? We've talked about the, uh, there's two mana cards, uh, the Ren's Resolve and uh, the original one. <laughs> uh, one in red, exile the top two cards from your library. So that just seems super powerful with Rocco. Uh, it seems super powerful with P and LR, right? Where you're all of a sudden you're, you're making one ones, you're putting plus one, plus one counters, you're getting food. Um, it's a more efficient way. Like you can cast it on turn two to make sure you hit your, your third uh, land drop. It's red. I think we kind of want to bias the deck a little bit more towards red. Uh, again, I think getting rid of Love Struck Beast and only playing uh, a bare minimum of green sources is, is maybe the way to go. And then I get nervous about playing Ossification once we cut the Restoration of Iganjo because we aren't going to have that many basic lands. So maybe we want to go up to the full Chain of the Rocks um, hmm. and really maximize our mountain count. Yeah, I like that change. I actually totally forgot about Rocco because there's a PNLR deck going around that is really going hard on Reckless Impulse, Ren's Resolve. And it's having some success. I thought Pia was like a lone wolf. I just forgot that Rocco also gives you bonuses off playing from exile. So yeah, that would streamline the deck quite a bit. I, I would even go so far as to cut the Fable of the Mirror Breakers. I know that's heresy, but um, you got to get the synergy in somewhere. Yeah, you do. I mean, you, you have lots to cut though. Like if you cut four Restoration, two Lovestruck Beast, four Stonebinders Familiar, uh, you're making room for a lot of stuff. Mm, true. Two Ossification. You know, you play one Chain of the Rocks. You, you still have four chain plus the four st stomps from Bone Crusher. Um, and then you, you can fix your mana at, at that point. You can like cut the Fable Passages. You don't have to play uh, all these basic planes. But yeah, this is, a, this is a super cool idea for a list. I, I actually really like this. This is kind of something I was thinking about doing. So uh, it's, it's lurking evil is uh, 10 steps ahead of me. But yeah, I love the idea of the, the Rocco plus the Pia. And just playing like a mid-range list, basically. And then you just, you need to find a way to interact with the unfair decks, right? So he's got like Containment Priest in his sideboard. He's got Archon of Amari in his sideboard. He's got Unlicensed Hearse in his sideboard. You could even consider playing Invasion uh, of Gobacon in your sideboard. When that flips, it, it's a card that gets cast from Exile. Uh, you do have a lot of bodies that can flip it and that can absorb the counters afterwards. So that's something to consider. Yeah, those are all good suggestions. All right, so that's a Naya Exile deck with Rocco Street Chef by Lurking Evil. From there, we move on and we're dipping over now to Modern, where our next deck is submitted by Woosh. It's Blue Black Rogues. Woosh has zeroed in on this card, Morsel Theft. I believe this is from Morning Tide. <laughs> Morning Tide had this really interesting mechanic called Prowl. Prowl says, you may play this card for his prowl cost if you dealt combat damage to a player this turn with a rogue. And the prowl cost is one and a black. So the face value of Morsel Theft is four mana for essentially a uh, creeping chill, right? Target player loses three life and you gain three life. But if Morsel Theft's prowl cost was paid, that means you're casting it for two mana and on top of that you get to draw a card. 
So you get this really attractive lightning helix plus draw card. All you have to do is connect with a rogue. When Morning Tide existed, there were no good rogues. But in the years since, we've had plenty, plenty of rogues to uh, like round out the rogue suite. So Woosh has put together a blue-black rogues list, and the rogues they've chosen are Mercurial Spell Dancer, Dolthy Voidwalker, and Brazen Borrower. Mercurial Spell Dancer, Phyrexian Rogue, cannot be blocked. It accumulates oil counters whenever you cast non-creature spells, and then you can cash in two oil counters whenever it deals combat damage to a player to double up your next spell. So you can imagine actually doubling up the Morsel Theft with the Prowl cost for a 6-life swing, 12-life swing actually, and drawing two cards. That's the dream. We have these 10 rogues, we have the Morsel Thefts, three copies, and then we have to interact, right? This is the classic uh, blue-black strategy. You gotta interact, so you have Thoughtseize, uh, Unearth to get back your creatures, there's Dismember, Fatal Push, Consider, Murderous Cut, Spell Pierce, and actually three copies of Wrench Mind for Mishra's Bubble. Kind of curious about those. I think the cool thing about Ur's uh, Mishra's Bobble is it turns on the Mercurial Spell Dancer on turn three in theory. Like you play Spell Dancer on two, mm -hmm. you can play the Bobble and a one drop, and then when it hits, you can Morsel Theft that turn. Okay. Yeah, you really want to like get your Spell Dancer value in quickly. Yeah. It's a card that it's pretty good in Legacy where the two drops just survive better. I've been skeptical in Modern just because a, a two one is so fragile. Um, with Ren and Six, and, and now with Orcish Bowmasters in the mix. But if we're going to try to do it, I mean, Morsel Theft is the card to, <laughs> the card to like really swing for the fences with. Probably if I were going to play this, I would go up to like 20 rogues. Like 10 is just not enough, even with the unearths. I, I'd be very concerned that I wouldn't be able to trigger Morsel Theft. That in turn means that the Spell Dancer is not going to be as reliable. So it's a, it's a tricky proposition. Like what would happen if we just played a more typical rogue suite? Like, uh, you know, Thea's Guild Enforcer, Soaring Thought Thief, that kind of thing. I mean, are those cards, uh, obviously in the postmodern world, they are not playable, but are, I mean, were they ever really playable? There was there ever like a rogues deck in modern? I'm trying to remember like before MH2 even. Was that a thing? I mean, we tried it. It wasn't, wasn't anything great. I mean, Dothy Voidwalker is really good, right? It gives your deck main deck answers to Graveyard Hate. It's good against Scam. Um, the Spell Dancer's fine. I don't think Wrench Mind is a um, a modern playable card, so I don't know that we need to be doing that. So there's like some cuts there. Mm -hmm. If we're gonna play the Unearth, maybe we just like play Spell or Snapcaster Mage as just like a value card. Yeah, maybe. I guess the other direction you could go is Bitter Blossom. I mean that that spits out rogue tokens, fairy rogues. Was once banned in modern. We need more banned cards in the deck, right? So yeah. Bitter Blossom's a fine place to start. Yes. And then I guess, I mean, the question is, if I were going to like seriously try to improve this, I would really take a hard look at Morsel Theft and just imagine that we always can do it and just see how it impacts the game. Because it can't actually hit creatures, it's, it's never going to be like two for one per se. It's just going to be a nice life swing that draws cards. And it's possible that that's just like not strong enough, but it would be sweet if it were. Yeah, and that's the issue, right? It's only a two for one if the three damage is bringing them closer to dying. Now, the three life might be very good with um, the uh, Bitter Blossom, right? So mm. that kind of intrigues me. Like it turns Bitter Blossom into a better card. Yes. There are other powerful cards that you can cast. Um, with prowl <laughs> so you know if you if you're going to go all in all in maybe you need to even play more prowl effects for mercurial spell dancer to copy there's a time walk <laughs> effect that's right yeah i love the idea i mean mercurial spell dancer is awesome i just it's just tough with bowmaster and ren and six exactly. like this is a bad time to uh, to be <laughs> living that dream so maybe that's a reason for us to go back to pioneer where we have our next brew submitted to us by Bridger, host of the Shock Seas podcast. And Bridger, uh, last time was asking us about the card Ren and Realmbreaker. Bridger's been a huge fan of Ren and Realmbreaker, advocate for it, and has been putting a lot of work in testing it, has submitted for us, for our consideration, a black-green rock list. Yeah, okay, so 25 lands, 
Interesting it includes an Argos Sanctum of Nature. So he uh, or they uh, might just think that it's a worthwhile card because the the quote-unquote combo is not here, right? There's no uh, legend to go with our Argoth. Three Ren and Realm Breaker. The normal suite, right? So our eight one-mana black spells, those are a moss. Two Heartless Act, okay, we've, we've teched it out. Two Assassin's Trophy, one Abrupt Decay. Creature Suite, three Glissa, that's a Dan uh, Shriver favorite. Three Jewel Thief, very interesting card. Three Tenacious Underdog, two Misery Shadow, three Shieldred. Um, the thing that I find interesting about this deck is you have some cards that suggest aggro, right? Tenacious Underdog is like an aggressive card. And then we have some cards that are a little more like value-y, like I think of Jewel Thief as a very excellent mid-range card, and same with Ren and Realm Breaker. So I'm wondering uh, if, if uh, Bridger is just a master of like switching roles in certain decks and, you know, kind of recognizing what needs to get played. Because they have a, you have a ton of three drops here. You have um, six, eight, eleven three drops. And they all are similar, but they all do slightly different things, right? Glissa dominates the board as a blocker. It can be card advantage engine. Jewel Thief turns on Thoughtseize, ramps possibly to double spell on turn four. Uh, Ren and Realm Breaker is just kind of like a value engine, very good against control decks. Um, and then you, you even have three Bankbuster main. So this is, this is a person who loves themselves uh, a lot of card draw. Uh, this is, there's a ton of card draw in this for a mid-range show. So maybe this is just teched out to go over the top of Red Black. And I would love to know more about Jewel Thief specifically. I didn't even realize this was a card. It's two and a green, three, three, Vigilance Trample, Cat Rogue, and when it enters the battlefield, you get a treasure. So it's like a, it's very much a draft card, right? It just doesn't scream constructed playable to me. Vigilance and Trample, I mean, they're not bad keywords, but they're, they're not the card, they're not the keywords we're looking for when we're building our constructed decks. The treasure is, I mean, treasures are always useful, but it must be a lot more useful than I'm envisioning. I guess it gives you a revolt, it gives you extra mana to, Use your bank busters, use the cards you find off Ren and Realm Breaker. We're playing a Jewel Thief over, I don't know, like a Liliana the Veil or something more interactive. We're playing it over Mana Elves. So, it, yeah, I think that what it, this shapes up to is like a very solid mid rangey deck, right? Bridger says they, they do great against Control, great against Rakdos. Um, they do well against Convoke and Humans. Possibly just because, you know, pilot skill, he's very experienced with this archetype. And that matches my experience of, you know, if you're taking a mid-range black-green deck into a matchup like that, right, you, it's anyone's ballgame. Uh, if you leverage your resources correctly, use your removal correctly. On the other hand, I think that Bridger said the decks they struggled with were, like, green decks. Right? Green could just go over the top. Yeah. There's just a lot of interesting choices in the mana. So 25 lands, that's pretty typical if you're not going to play a mana elf. That's fine. Uh, you don't get to play Fable to, to you know, smooth your draws. So one of Argoth, oh, that's, that's an interesting choice. I'm not sure that's right or wrong. One Demo Field, one Field of Ruin. That's interesting. Red Black does not play either of those effects. Two Mutal Vault. Mm -hmm. And then one of Mana Confluence. You know, you'd think in a Black Green list, your mana would be good enough that you don't have to do that. But maybe you need to stretch it to, to try to get some more value from your creatures. And there's enough life gain with the three shieldreds um, that you and the two graveyard trespassers that you feel like you can spare it. Let's just make the land more waste. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems like that's got to be better, right? Because you you never need the other color. You even get treasures from the jewel thief. Right. Okay, I'm not sure what the answer is, but Bridger, I would love to know more about the details of this mana base. But yeah, it seems like this is. The current home for Red and Realm Breaker from the mind of a Red and Realm Breaker enthusiast. So, interesting to see how this one is shaping up. It looks fun to test. All right, next deck up Dredge for Bones. Oh my gosh, David, this one's going to you. Dredge for Bones, submitted to us by Tuesday Tastic. Tuesday Tastic, awesome name. So, they are describe the deck so we have what they would call like the quote unquote dredge traditional dredge game plan now just a reminder there are no cards with the actual dredge keyword in pioneer and the traditional dredge deck hasn't really shown up as a 5-0 list very frequently of late but for a while a brief moment in pioneer there was word decks that did that so they would include a lot of the cards so I, i'm assuming the, the package he's describing is the 
Creeping Chill, Otherworldly Gaze, Stitcher Supplier, Prized Amalgam, Silver Smoke Ghoul, Haunted Dead. That's the quote-unquote dredge game plan dredge package. And in every dredge deck, you'll see some of those cards. Sometimes they'll splash green for other milling effects. This deck is just straight black-green. So with that shell, he's combined it with uh, some mid-range cards. So he has added Clackbridge Troll, uh, Fatal Push, Thoughtseize, Otherworld, or excuse me, uh, and then Blood for Bones. So you have this reanimatory plan for your Clackbridge Troll. He and he's also playing as one of his like beefy creatures, Dream Eater, which is one of the few like beefy people might not know what this card does, but it uh, actually surveils four when it comes into play, so it can trigger your other dredgers <laughs> again if if you are lucky off the top of your deck. Surveil four is awesome, but it is a six mana card with three toughness. So so Dream Eater is four blue blue Nightmare Phoenix Flash flying. When it enters the battlefield, surveil four. When you do, you may return target non land permanent to an, uh, an opponent controls to its hand. So it's you know. A bounce effect, it's a 4-3 flyer, but I, I don't think this card is good enough to be a Blood for Bones target. On the other hand, um, they point out that Clackbridge Troll is amazing with Silver Smoke Ghoul. So you could sacrifice your Silver Smoke Ghoul to your uh, Blood for Bones. You get back your Clackbridge Troll, and then it makes three goats, and your opponent can sacrifice a creature when Clackbridge Troll uh, goes to combat. But if they do... Uh, you tap the troll and you gain three life and draw a card. So you get back your silver smoke ghoul. So that's something I'd never heard of before. Dan, you've noted here the same thing. I, th this is uh, an interaction that had never occurred to me. It's brilliant. And it's, it's also just, it's very, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> what? How do you find this? I, I love the interaction. And just for that alone, I, I mean, I love this deck. But I do agree with David. Blood for Bones. Okay, you, you have the graveyard set up, but it's still four mana. It's still four mana and you're losing a piece in play. So the thing you're getting back, it better be good. And I don't think we have a, a target like that as currently con constructed. Like Dream Eater is just not good enough. I hate to see it. On the other hand, like because we're playing the Blood for Bones, Dream Eater, Clackbridge Troll package, I think we're a little bit light on the early turns. Like just, um, I mean, comparing this to like Crab Vine, which I, I would play at least four, maybe even six or eight more enablers. I don't know what that would be. Merfolk Seeker Keeper would be an option. I do think you just need a little more stuff to get your core dredge going. And now if you want to say, I still want to play the Clackbridge Troll, I, I would support that. <laughs> right? Go ahead, put the Clackbridge Troll in, because we do need to like have something else to support the Silver Smell. It's Creeping Chill alone isn't quite enough. Yeah, I guess the the one thing I would flag here is when your like plan B also involves the graveyard, that means that you are really all in on the graveyard, right? So your plan B to play fair still involves blood for bonesing a creature out of your graveyard. So that makes me a little nervous, right? That we have this secondary plan, but it's still in, you know it's still weak to the exact same sideboard cards. Yeah, and maybe the troll is a solution to that because that's just like a big big beefy thing. So. Yeah, and five mana isn't like impossible in this deck. We we do have twenty lands, and you know, you can sack a silver smoke ghoul to draw a card. Yeah, very cool find by Tuesday Tastic. They used to have this great magic blog called Only on Tuesdays, and that's where the, I think their name came from. They would post about a sweet brew every Tuesday. I don't know if they're still doing that, but if you're listening and you uh, if you want to revive that, I'm interested. <laughs> so next up. Still in Pioneer, we have Miss Marvel, submitted to us by Ignacio E. Referring here to Etherworks Marvel, oh boy. Energy deck. Energy deck. Love to see this. <laughs> so Ignacio says, Through my latest testings, I found that the energy mechanic, while not especially interesting when you are just trying to turbo out Emrakul, is actually pretty effective at enabling a painless five-color mana base. And since the Turbo Energy decks of early Pioneer proved to be unsuccessful, I thought that maybe what Etherworks Marvel needed was something more mid-rangey with a chance of exploding into Atraxa. Okay, so Emrakul is out, Emrakul's old news. Atraxa is in. We've still got the core energy cards. There's really not, not that many to choose from. So that's Marvel, that's Harness Lightning, probably still bugged, unfortunately. <laughs> Attune with Ether and Rogue Refiner. 
the five color mana base comes from Itum with Ether and Ether Hub. So that's your smooth five color mana. What do you get for playing smooth five color mana? Well, you get to play Omnath, four copies of Omnath, four copies of Atraxa, which is a seven drop, but by, by then you'll have your colors and you can also cheat it and play with Marvel sometimes, and three copies of Invasion of Alara. Invasion of Alara Wooburg, it's a battle with seven defense. When it enters a battlefield, you, you basically double cascade. You're looking for two non-lands, mana value four or less. One of them you cast, one of them goes into your hand. If you defeat the battle, you get this massive effect, Awaken the Maelstrom, which I'm not even sure what it does. You get all kinds of stuff um, <laughs> if you ever win this battle. I know you can put an artifact from your hand into play, which is the most random <laughs> thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, David, what do you make of this? Okay. First of all, the number one way to turn on energy is that two mana artifact that makes like three energy when it comes into play, and then you can like sack it to gain life mm -hmm. and get even more energy. And we're not playing that. So we're not even playing all the energy enablers. We're just playing a Dune with Ether, Harness Lightning, and um, Rogue Refiner. Okay, fair enough. So we're, we're functionally a base teamer deck. And I don't think that that's a, a bad place to be. Um, my concern is that we're just a little too confident on some of these mana choices. For instance, this deck is playing four Chain to the Rocks and no Triomes. So we have to like Fable Passage for a Mountain. Uh, and then we'd have to find a Plains to put it on the Mountain. And none of those is really in align with casting a Tomb with Aether on turn one. Unless we have specifically Ether Hub. Um, hmm. So, like, we're, okay, we have this energy that lets us do this. We can play other hub on turn one, spend our energy to attune with ether, get two more energy, find a, a plains, or excuse me, find a mountain, put that into play, spend one of our remaining energy to chain to the rocks. I don't think chain to the rocks is, is a good enough removal spell to justify all this extra work that we need to do. Um, I think that it's, I think that actually Harness Lightning is a, is a fine, um, removal spell by itself a two mana removal spell that can functionally kill uh all the cards you wanted to kill and even kill shieldred in the mid to late game if we don't if we don't get too aggressive with our energy um so that that's just one thing that stuck out to me the attracts a plan so the way that we had to cheat attracts into play is the marvel without the main energy enabler or we could invasion of alara it is that the thought process uh, can we invasion? I mean, invasion. But it doesn't do do that, right? No, I, I think we either marvel it or we have to hard cast it, and that's also a question I'm I'm trying to figure out because there is a path to seven mana. You have Omnath plus Fable Passage. That's one way. There's also four Risen Reef, which I could imagine Risen Reef hitting a land or two over the course of the game if you get lucky. But yeah, I, I'm not seeing the path to like make Atraxa useful as a card that you draw. And I'm wondering if, like, maybe we just need, like, something else like a Fable of a Mirror Breaker. I, I don't know. Generic smoothing card that can ramp you a little bit. They'll probably kill it. That will add counters to your Aetherworks Marvel. That's not nothing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the problem is if you're playing Marvel, you kind of have to be all in on the energy. Because if, the, if you don't have enough energy, Marvel doesn't do anything, right? Mm. Um, True. So are there effects that... Um, can like proliferate is is another option. You know they gave us some new proliferate cards. I I also don't hate like Elish Norn plus Omnath as the basis of all this. And maybe you don't need a Traxa at all. But then what are you marveling for? So I I just it feels like it's it's being torn in a lot of different directions. You, there's also not enough lands uh, for uh, a tune with Ether. Uh, Twenty two lands is is I don't believe enough. Even with two oath. Hmm. Okay, so there's a little more maybe just tweaking to do with the bottom of the curve here. Yeah, I would love to see Marvel's, you know, it gives you an energy every time a permanent dies on your side, and like treasure tokens count, and that interaction wasn't available before, so I'm just wondering if there's something there. Well, that's why I kind of like it with Fable. Like the one thing that Fable does is put a bunch of random shit into play, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh jeweled thief is another card that i actually like kind of think of <laughs> okay uh again like another card that is like full ramp but you only kind of need to ramp the one time 
Um, and it, it's also giving you, you know, a, a permanent that is going to die. So I like the idea though, like, okay, we're going to play energy and then we're gonna have this great mana. I just don't know that like you want to do that with Marvel because what we're saying is we're going to spend all this energy to make our mana perfect. Then we're not going to have any mana left over to trigger our Marvel. I kind of think you have to pick one or the other. Last card you might consider is that that enchantment all will be one five mana but whenever you get any kind of counter including energy counters you can pass damage around okay that's a slow card but maybe that's not like a terrible marvel hit if everything else in your deck would trigger it would would give you energy and therefore distribute damage well and then you could maybe like get rid of some of these colors too like if you played that as your hit and not attracts our invasion you can get rid of black entirely and maybe you can just play like teamer and you're just splashing white for omnath okay yeah I'd, I'd be interested in invasion of ixalan the two mana one that digs five for a permanent because that also brings five defense counters with it so that would find your marvel that would find your right. um all will be one or something ah it's interesting i'm glad that ignacio has not given up the dream of an energy deck because it was such a dominant mechanic in its day in standard and it's, it's just kind of sad that it's been like power crept out of pioneer yeah and because they're not going to like print more energy cards it really is just kind of like locked in time like until they decide to break the mechanic again in you know modern horizons three or four mm -hmm. it you know it, it's a very it, you know parasitic mechanic like we talked about it only interacts with itself and other than proliferate and they have printed some good proliferate cards lately uh, there, there's not that much to do with the energy. Agreed. All right, David, next deck up. All right, Legendary Combos by Patrick Thomas, P-Tom. Okay, so this is a Grease Fang deck. So we have Grease Fang, Chariot, Parhelion. But he is really, or they are really leaning into Plaza of Heroes. So uh he also <laughs> the dreaded double combo where's damon he also has the rona retraction helix combo in here so almost all the creatures except for one di diligent excavator are legendary so he's playing the full four mox amber but because he's playing all these looters jace and rona and emery to help fill the graveyard he has like a back doorway to fill the graveyard for his grease fang um so he's he's got all these colors and he's he's even splashing green just for Tyvar, and he's doing that with the power and theory of Plaza of Heroes. So I like this idea exactly like the last deck. These are really creative ways of really pushing the mana to the limit. Like, are we not building these decks because you know you'd have to play so many shock lands and how uh, consistent can you be? Both of these people are really thinking about we actually have a bunch of five mana lands that don't hurt us. And is there some way to get an extra payoff for getting to play, in theory, getting to pick the best cards from a bunch of this stuff? Um, I do like that uh, Jace and allows you to cast Can't Stay Away for only two mana from the graveyard. It's like another backdoor way of getting your Grease Fang back. I like that Tyvar just randomly loots and it can find uh, you know, one piece or another. I like the Force Skrell to protect your various combo pieces. Um, there's no interaction in this deck except for Retraction Helix itself. Um, but we've seen that typically when you attack on two different axes and the way that you kind of beat the Rona combo versus the uh, Parhelion combo are different, um, then, then you can kind of get paid off. The, the, the real issue is that only Dil Diligent Excavator is a win with, when you activate the Rona combo, right? There's no other way. I believe that if you have a Tyvar, that should win. Because you just bounce the Tyvar a bunch of times and minus to it. And then what happens next? That eventually, I think that finds the Diligent Excavator eventually. And then you switch back to bouncing the Amber. So you have five cards between the four Tyvars and the one Diligent Excavator that complete the run of combo. Okay. And you need to already have the Tyvar in play, though. Because you need to be able to make the black and green with the Mox Amber while you're bouncing it. Correct, yeah. So it's like yeah. several pieces. It's Rona, it's Amber, it's Helix, plus the fourth piece, Tyvar or Diligent Excavator. Yeah. It's a surprising shell. I mean, I did not realize that all of these pieces are legends. So like combining these two different 
combo packages, the Grease Fang and the, the Rona combo, and like this sort of sideways Emery package that kind of glues it all together. And the fact that they're all legends is, is a very cool find. I agree with David, there's no interaction whatsoever, so you're really putting the pressure on yourself to like do this quickly. And I, I'm not sure, I'd have to see how it plays out to see how long it actually takes to do this. I think it's also, also going to be tricky to sideboard just because you're like, you're right at the threshold of like not having enough stuff to support each of these packages. Like there's barely enough artifacts for Emery. There's only the Skrulls and the Ambers. Uh, I don't know if we count the Chariot for that. Barely enough two drops for Tyvar's minus two to be good. Like it, it will work, but if you have to sideboard, then you kind of have to take one package out and it starts to lose its cohesiveness. And you really do not have that many ways. Like you have no, you have, Six creatures that loot, but they have to untap to do so unless you have a tie far in play. So you have no like built in loots. No, you know, you, you're just kind of blind milling for the most part, right? Emery just mills, tie just mills. So you do not have a lot of control about getting Parhelion in your graveyard. So what about Rafine? I mean, take a page from the Classic Legends deck. That's what I was thinking. I, I think Rafine's just a straight up better card than Emery. I don't think it's even close. And like you say, there's so few Emery targets here. Maybe this is just the way to go. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I mean that's a easy enough swap that takes the pressure off of you to like keep your legend your artifact count high. Um, can't play Denik. Denik will shut off the Grease Fang combo, but um, <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's, we get Grease Fang instead. <laughs> Ambitious concept from Patrick Thomas, and uh, I'm excited to see where he goes with it. From there, we shift back into modern. The fast-paced world of Modern, where if you're going to play a deck full of legends, you get a bunch of new toys now. Um, there's, there's a perfect mana dork called Delighted Halfling from Lord of the Rings that's like a cavern of souls for legends. And people have been having great success with this in a bunch of different shells, including in Winota. So the list we have before us is a Winota list submitted to us by Spencer Hanks, who is a big Winota enthusiast. Um, been watching Spencer along with Dak Faden 07 post a bunch of Winota brews in the Discord, many of them featuring the Delighted Halfling um, and cards like the Three Mana Summit from March of the Machine Aftermath, which turns out to be like an excellent hit for Winota, it turns out. But interestingly, Spencer has not gone with green. Like the deck he was submitted here is actually black, right? So it's red white with a light black splash. Mardu Winota, why black? Because of Orcish Bowmasters, four copies of Bowmasters, and actually two copies of Jarena Dauntless General. It's another two drop that's a human. The rest of your cards are your kind of Boros Winota core, which means you have your Season Pyromancer, your Ranger Captain of Eos, your four Winota. That's the human component. The rest of it is going to be non humans that set up the Winota. So you have Ragavans there, you have four Giver of Runes, one Frodo, three Samwise the Stout Hearted, one Eowyn Fearless Knight, three Solitudes. And kind of surprisingly, there's four ephemerates here because, um, you know, Season Pyromancer works with that, Ranger Captain of Eos works with that, and then Orcish Bowmasters works with that as well, and Samwise. So I guess the hypothesis is like, what if Orcish Bowmasters is just like the most amazing Winota labeler in, that we've ever seen? Right, like a card that gives you two bodies, neither of which are human, that also inter interacts with your opponent, right? It kills some things or... or precious planeswalkers or whatever exactly and we went into great depth on this card um mana symbol and i in our last episode all about bowmasters you can go back and hear about that the evidence is rolling in that bowmasters is a fine playable card you're seeing it picked up by zero synergy decks decks like racto scam decks like black green rock are just playing bowmasters maybe still experimenting but it's it's holding its own and then you can increase the synergy from there going wide with it like yogmoth is doing or, in this case, going wide like Winota is doing. And, you know, it's not going to be an amazing card. We're not looking to get extra triggers out of it. Uh, well, I guess we can ephemerate it for extra triggers. <laughs> but, um, I mean, yeah, if it just supports Winota while being a fine interactive piece on its own, like, this would be a very exciting direction. And Spencer said they just got a 4-1 with this list um, just this week. Do you think we want, like, more humans to hit? Or it's just, like, hitting Ranger Captain and Season Pyromancer, that's just, like rock solid value and they're also playable cards if you don't draw your winota that's tough yeah i mean there's 14 humans here and that's like right at right at the line 14 15 15 or 16 would be a little better but 
Uh, I mean, Jarena's so small, too. I don't know if she even counts. <laughs> yeah, so she is graveyard hate, right? Yeah. She protects your humans. Oh, I guess Eowyn is a human as well. Okay, so 15 hits. Oh, yeah, the fearless knight, dude. Okay, so we, we could, in theory, up the human count. The ephemerate little scam package with a solitude. I mean, that's interesting. All right, I'm going to take Spencer's word for it that this is a promising direction to explore. I, I know Dak Fade No 07 is also interested in the Bowmasters supporting Winota. I was thinking, like, what if we got a little bit greedier, right? I, I kind of love the idea of Delated Halfling giving you an uncounterable Winota. I, I could see that just being way better than Giver of Runes. And I love the idea of Samut, right? Samut, the three mana Samut that draws cards whenever a creature that entered the battlefield this turn connects for damage. It turns out to just be an, an amazing Winota hit. Um, so you could play that, and that, that's going to be your human count instead of Jarena, and you just have, like, higher quality of creatures all around. You could still have Bowmasters in that deck, right? The mana is very good in modern, right? Just like Patrick Tonic was saying, we could, we could play <laughs> these five-color lands if we have to. Um, tons of options here. I think Sam Black just put an article out uh, where, where he was looking specifically at, like, what would the mana base look like for... I think it actually was a Winota deck. It was, like, a legendary Winota deck uh, using some of these new tools from Lord of the Rings. So yeah, why not get greedy with it? Go go four colors, go five if you want. Get Joda the Unifier in there. Yeah, I mean, I like an Avalanche Riders if we're going to play Ephemerate as well. It's like just a sweet human to hit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Three in the sideboard in Spencer's list, but yeah. Yeah, so maybe that's a better place for him is the sideboard. Okay, well, I feel like a 5-0 is coming. Uh, I don't know what it will look like, but I'm excited for Spencer to update us on that when it happens. All right, from there, we go back to Pioneer. For Pioneer Living End. Okay, what's this, David? <laughs> what do we got here? All right, this is by Odin's Blue Black Cauldron. So he mentions that there is <laughs> there is a cycle <laughs> from one of the more powerful sets in memory. We know a few of those cards, and the card he's wanting to explore is Cauldron of Eternity. Now, this is a 12-mana card. <laughs> um, I believe it costs two less to cast for each creature card in your graveyard. So it's 10 black black, two colorless less to cast for each creature card in our graveyard. And then once it's in play, whenever a creature we control dies, we put it on the bottom of, of its owner's library. So cards don't keep going back to our graveyard. And then for Tuna Black, tap it, pay two life, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So once it's in play, it's basically casting Resurrection uh, for three mana every turn at sorcery speed for the rest of the game. So in theory, if you have five creatures in play, you can play this for two mana and then activate it for three mana every turn for the rest of the game. That's the dream. That's basically living end, right? <laughs> That's... As a living end player, that's pretty much living end. So one of the things he points out here is that all these cards are reasonable cyclers. Um, and so you're not losing a lot by just having them go to the graveyard. So he's got Curator of Mysteries. That is a card from Living End, as you've mentioned. Waker of Waves, Striped Riverwinder. Mirror Shell Crab, not currently in any uh, Living End decks, but it's a, it's a fine card. You know, s the discard ability is functionally a counterspell. Um, I don't even know what Gloomfang Mauler does. <laughs> I gotta look it up here. I had to look that up too. It's like a two mana Swamp Cycler, I think. Yeah. God, it's such a shame that the one mana Land Cyclers from Lord of the Rings are not Pioneer Legal. Because those cards have been really impressive in modern living end we, we've seen some modern living index going down to 14 lands now with uh, oliphants and uh, trolls of causes doom that kind of thing even the green one too and they're, they're playing fury everything it's yeah it looks very very scary in pioneer you have to pay two to land cycle which is a little bit less exciting kudos to odin's for trying this i mean identifying that okay a lot of the cyclers well half of the cyclers that modern living end uses are pioneer legal so what if there's something there that's part of it and then secondarily maybe there's a more efficient reanimation spell that we haven't considered in pioneer in the form of cauldron of eternity 
that could be true. That that does not add up to living end. Right? There's still no interactive component here, and I think Odense recognizes that, and that's why there's 16 interactive spells in the deck. You kind of have to do it, but it kind it kind of hurts a little bit. Like, <laughs> at what turn are we ever going to have enough time to like get four or five creatures in the graveyard for the cauldron? It's going to take a while. It's still a five mana total investment plus all the mana we spent cycling. And we're not actually interacting when we bring something back. We're not disrupting the opponent. We're just adding a, a medium large creature on our side of the board. So that's going to be the challenge here. I'm not quite sure what the solution would be. Yeah, the other problem is these creatures aren't that good. So even if you told me I could pay three mana and two life to cast a Curator of Mysteries, that's not that much better than four mana. Um, so that that's another major concern, right? Is Okay, the first Waker of Waves, you're getting a lot for your three mana, but the rest of these things, I mean, <laughs> Gloomfang Mauler, I'm not that excited about having it in play. <laughs> Would you be more interested in Colossal Sky Turtle? Like it's a 6-5 flyer, at least, with Ward. Yeah, and it's all, again, it's it's an interactive way to put something in the graveyard, right? You take your turn off, you you blink their uh, Land War Elf or something to buy a turn, it goes to the graveyard. I mean, the problem is like a single Karn fetching up a graveyard hate piece undoes everything. Cauldron of Eternity, you know, is never coming down before turn. If you have four creatures in your graveyard on turn four, which is mm -hmm. possible, then it costs four mana. So that's like the best case scenario. Right, right. And that's just, that's, that's tapping out to play it. You're not even getting a creature that turn. So that, that's a, you know. I feel like you have to wait till you have five creatures. That's the only way it kind of makes sense. And if that's the case, right. maybe we maybe we need more creatures. Well, I, I think we do, but the problem is you you also can't have done nothing to your point because this doesn't actually sweep their board. So if they're you know doing mono green stuff, they've just got they might even have better creatures than you, even though you've cheated your awaker waves into play. So what about like Omen Hawker? I know that's not a cycler, but it pays for the cycling cost. Yes, it will die, but it, that will fuel, fuel the cauldron <laughs> called eternity, so that's not a horrible outcome. And it would allow you to interact a little bit better, right? It would allow you to use your mirror shell crab as a counter spell a little bit more efficiently. I think you just have to play more creatures. I don't think you can play Cruelty of Gix. If you think Cauldron of Eternity is the card, and you know that's what we're trying to try out, I think the first thing you have to do is cut your two Cruelty of Gixes and a couple of your two mana removal spells. Just rely on Fatal Push and Thoughtseize, and you just have to play more creatures and see if it, it gets there. I actually don't think that's a terrible idea, Dan. Like, you play it on one. You could also, I guess, oh, you can't self-mill with the crab. Mm. The only crab that's legal in Pioneer only mills them. You could do Stitcher Supplier. You could do the... Uh... Yeah, I mean, you have to do something like that. But I do think that if you don't want to do just self-mill then the best way to do it is exactly what you're saying. You play the one drop that lets you cycle. Then they either have to play off curve to kill your guy or they let you, you know, tap it to maybe cycle stripe river winder or waker of waves and find another one. <laughs> All right. So ambitious plan from Odin's for the pioneer living end. We're not quite there yet, but I'm going to spec heavily on cauldron of eternity because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we know there's one good mythic in the cycle. <laughs> Could be this one. Who knows? All right, we have time for, uh, looks like, maybe a couple more. So let's dip back into, oh, let's we'll stay in Pioneer, excuse me. We'll stay in Pioneer for Vesuvian Mindbreaker of the Dross. Oh boy, that's, that's promising. Submitted to us by Brandon Redden. Brandon writes that they wanted to explore Vesuvian Drifter after seeing some legacy in Modern Brews. It has the potential to combo with both Teresian Mindbreaker and Archfiend of the Dross on turn four depending on which second piece is drawn in combination with Scheming Symmetry. Okay, you got to explain this to me, David. What's going on here? Yeah, so Vesuvian Drifter is a really cool card. Two and a blue, and uh, at the beginning of combat on your turn, you can look at the top of your uh, deck. I, I should say, you can look at the top card of your library at any time. At the beginning of each combat, you can reveal that card, and if you reveal a creature, it becomes a copy of that card accepted as flying. So it's a 3 mana 2-4 flyer. Um, one of my thoughts is to maybe try to find a card with haste, but what he's saying is we play it on 3. Let's assume it lives. On turn 4, we manipulate the top of our deck. So it could either be an Archfiend of the Dross, 
or a um, Teresian Mindbreaker. So just a reminder, the Teresian Mindbreaker is a seven mana six four. When it attacks, your opponent mills half their deck, and it has a uh, unearth cost of one blue, blue, blue. So we had identified that as a card, right, with Frank Sanity on three. If you had some way to put the Mindbreaker in your graveyard on four, uh, you just could buy it back from your graveyard, attack, you, it mills half their library, but Frank Sanity at the end of your turn doubles that. So what he's saying is if you turn three Drifter, if you've drawn Metamorphic Alteration and you can put Archery into the Dross on top, you can do that combo. And if you have Drifter in play and you've drawn Frank Sanity, you just play Frank Sanity, play your fourth land, Scheming Symmetry, put the Teresian Mindbreaker on top, and then you can execute that combo. So the Drifter becomes like functional extra copies of either creature. Okay, by itself, it's just a two for a flyer for three. That's not horrible. That's actually a pretty good rate. <laughs> for a... Yeah, I mean, it's not terrible, right? It, it, you're not writing home about it, but... But in order for it to successfully execute a combo, you need to draw both Mindbreaker and Sanity or both Archfiend plus Alteration. Is that right? Well, you don't have to draw the Mindbreaker. So Scheming Symmetry mm. means you, like, once you have yes. Drifter in play, you unfortunately, it's only the top of your deck. It can't be in your hand. So you get a one in 52 shot to have it on top of your deck, or you can scheming symmetry, or you can otherworldly gaze uh, to manipulate the top of your deck. Okay, so let's go harder on that. I mean, maybe we should just play more gaze. There's only one copy here. I, li I like to go up to four, and I might even consider like changing the mana to play the one, the land that puts the creature on top of your deck, the Witch's Cottage. So make it like a Witch's Cottage mana base. And now you have even more ways to make the drifter happen right symmetry is very clever it's very efficient but it's also like kind of a blank card i have a hard time imagining ever casting this except on the turn i'm trying to win so it's kind of just a dead card yeah and the, the problem with symmetry is that it um it doesn't do anything if you draw the like normal combo it only interacts with drifter right so if i draw the archfiend of dross Scheming Symmetry, in theory, lets me put the Metamorphic Alteration on top, but my opponent <laughs> is getting to pick their top card as well, and they're probably going to pick a card that interacts with that combo. Um, so so it's... If you're going to play Scheming Symmetry, I wonder if you also have to play Consider so you can get that card that turn mm. instead of Tainted Indulgence. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, why not? Although I guess indulgence, right? There's a chance you would just draw the mindbreaker, and you really, you really gotta get it out of your hand, right? <laughs> um, it's no good in your hand. It's a seven draw, right? Yeah, I mean this deck is doing a lot of things, and that's a problem, right? You need to have scheming symmetry to support Vesuvian Drifter. You need to have Frank Sanity to support Mindbreaker. You need to have Metamorphic Alteration to support Archfiend of Dross. So yes, it means you have a bunch of different ways to combo, but it also means you have a bunch of different pieces that don't do much unless you have the other piece. So would a solution be to just cut one of the combos, cut the weaker one, but maybe keep the Drifter as a backup plan to your better combo, which I'm guessing is Archfiend, uh, just based on the lack of success for Theresian Mindbreaker? Yeah, maybe. I think you also just want random ways to like move stuff off the top of your library. Like you just like effects like consider mm. or like just any any ability to manipulate it maybe maybe the full four gaze i guess the problem for drifter is you just your random hits are so rare then like if it's just four draws most of the time it's mm. not gonna have anything but i guess if you're playing for scheme, scheming symmetry okay hmm. i think it's really hard to build the mana base you're describing dan and still play like an effective blue black shell because there's only four blue black lands that you get to play if you're playing enough swamps to trigger the you're not looking to play a bunch of triumphs because <laughs> that's what I would do. Yeah, I guess you could. It's it's a fair. It's it's that's not crazy, and you could play mostly black cards, right? Like you don't have to play that many. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. Well, it's an intriguing proposition from Brandon Redden. The Stephen Drifter, it could just be awesome. I've seen people trying this in modern and having a lot of success with it. So maybe it's better than we think. It's more of an on rate creature in Pioneer, so it could just be like this hidden powerhouse that we haven't really thought through yet. I should mention that uh, this is not the only Archfiend of the Dross deck that was submitted today. There were actually like two or three more submitted to the Brew Review, and 
we hear you. We see you. We see you, Archfiend fans. And actually, that is our card of the week. So in our next episode, David and I will be diving deep into Archfiend of the Dross. So we'll, we'll hit those decks in our next show. That being said, we have time for maybe, let's do one more list. We're a little bit over. Let's do one more list because I, I do love this ne next one here. Going back to modern here for Mono Green Jeskai Ascendancy. Mono Green Jeskai Ascendancy. You love to see this. Submitted by Toffer, who has written a lovely write-up here all about the deck. Uh, talks about how he originally conceived it as a bit of a meme uh, way, way back when Arkham's Astrolabe was still legal and modern. But it's like almost there. So what is the concept here? Well, we all know how Jeskai's Ascendancy can work right? You, you need to get a mana dork in play. Then you can, every time you cast a non-creature spell with the Ascendancy, you get to loot, you get to untap all your creatures, untap your mana dork, you get to grow the creature, so you can potentially just keep casting spells as long as the mana dork generates enough mana to cast whatever thing you're trying to cast. And we've seen that done in Pioneer with um, Sylvan Carriage, right? right, David? Uh, yes. Sometimes the, the Paradise Druid. We've seen it done in modern occasionally with Fate Stitcher. I mean, that's a pretty good one because you can just unearth it. <laughs> but what Toffer is trying to do is just kind of tendency with Dryad Arbor. So Dryad Arbor, much maligned card. Terrible card. Everyone complains about how awful it is whenever they put it in their deck. Toffer is going the complete opposite direction. He's saying this is the most <laughs> important card of the deck, Dryad Arbor. This is your mana dork that allows you to build a deck with like it actually only has like two creatures, it has two Arbor Elves and then two Dryad Arbors. But because you're in modern, you have all the fetch lands can get Dryad Arbor. You have cards like uh, Safe Right Quest is allowed to get a Dryad Arbor. You have pretty good confidence that you can at least find the first Arbor and, and possibly two. Actually, the way to go infinite in this deck, as Toffer explains it, is to have two Dryad Arbors going with the Ascendancy. How is that ever going to happen? Well, post mortem lunge can reanimate a creature for one turn with haste and you only have to pay mana equal to the mana cost of that creature with which in dryad arbor's case is zero so if you're gonna target a dryad arbor in your graveyard with a post-mortem lunge you can do that for two phyrexian excuse me you can do that for two life paying the phyrexian cost and zero mana so it's almost free dryad arbor comes back with haste it's ready to go you're going to start chaining through the Ascendancy, doing your thing. All the creatures, excuse me, all the spells here cost a single green. That's Abundant Harvest, that's Commune with Spirits, that's a Safe Right Quest, Regrowth, uh, Noxious Revival, Utopia Sprawl, Unbridled Growth, Abundant Growth. Some of them cost two mana, but um, like Life from the Loam is here, Commune with the Gods is here. At two mana, you do need to be have either two Dryad Arbors in play or have an Arbor Elf going which will generate progressively more mana if you get like Utopia Sprawls piled up on a land. So it's, it's a very clever way of like answering Jeskai Ascendancy's requirements. You do end up with this like hilarious mono green splashing a Jeskai card. I think Toffer said the biggest problem is actually just like finding the Ascendancy. That's the, that's the one effect you don't have that much redundancy on. And these Commune with the Gods are maybe not enough. Even, even with Commune with the Spirits and Commune with the Gods, maybe it's not enough to reliably find the Ascendancy. But, I mean, the concept is just so innovative. I'd love to see it. Yeah, you're trying to get <laughs> Dryad Arbor in play in your Jeskai Ascendancy list. So Dryad Arbor, of course, can't help you cast <laughs> Jeskai Ascendancy. <laughs> but I guess you have Life from the Loam to get back your Arbors if you need them, to get back your lands if they're getting uh, destroyed, because you only have a precious few number of lands that actually make blue or white or red mana. One stomping ground, one temple garden, one breeding pool, <laughs> two forest. Loam is a cool find because that's actually how you how you go infinite. Like once you have the mana part satisfied, you can actually use the loots from Ascendancy to rebuy the loam with a dredge every time and like go through the entire deck. So it's, it's very clever. I I don't know. <laughs> Obviously, Toffer has played this a bunch of times for years, actually, so I, I'm not going to recommend any improvement. Uh, he knows that you can, he mentions he could add Sterling Groves, he could add Glittering Wishes to it. Unclear, like, if that would improve the deck or not. Is there another way to get the Ascendancy that we're not thinking of? In mono green? <laughs> uh, not that I know of. Yeah. I mean, 
How are you winning here? You're making your two two lands infinitely large? Is that the... Like, if they have two blockers, you actually don't win that turn? Or, I mean, you have no way to get rid of them. Okay, so you, you get your mana engine going. You go through the entire deck. You will draw everything. You will get all the stuff with life from the looms. You'll regrowth whatever you mill like that. So you'll have everything. You'll have your entire deck at your disposal and infinite mana. Yeah. So let's say I just gave you 50,000 mana and this is your hand. And all the lands are in play, we can imagine, in a Jeskai Ascendancy. Yep. Yeah, I think you attack him with the Dryad Arbor. <laughs> And they won't even see it coming because the Dryad Arbor was hiding among your basic lands in the back. <laughs> so they won't even realize you had attackers. Also, this is the kind of deck where I would 100% time out, like in game one, <laughs> trying to like figure out what the hell's going on. Right. It's almost like impossible to actually test online. That's a shame. Um, yeah. Yeah, like you say, just a super innovative deck by uh, Topher. I mean, I just never would have even considered this. It, it just looks like it's like very functional <laughs> like 16 land for abundant harvest actually seems very reasonable the community spirits like i'm actually shocked by how well i think this would play like i don't think it does very well against interaction um i don't think it can win easily through blockers but uh it's it's like shocking how good this deck actually looks like it would play considering he's decided to like handicap himself by making this deck mono green yeah yeah I thought it was like definitely a meme. It is a meme, but it, it looks very functional. Yes. All right, David. I think we're going to have to leave it here. We didn't quite get to everyone. There's still a few more. There's still some arch fiend lists. Those are coming next episode, but to those we didn't get to, uh, they're going to be in the extended show notes with our comments added there. So you can, you can still see what everyone else is working on. And of course, discussions popping off on the discord people are posting this there with uh, it's a lot of fun seeing what everyone's working on so thanks to everyone who submitted for this edition of the brew review if you would like to join us and submit your list you can always join our patreon find it at patreon.com slash faith is brewing we'd love to see you there and i think that's gonna do it for us david yeah absolutely that's this was fun all right, so we will see you in just a few days. We'll have fresh brews with Archfiend and maybe a little trophy action. David got a little trophy action going. Uh, yes. Invasion of Gobacon. So stay tuned <laughs> for that, and we'll see you next time. All right, take care. Deck lists for this episode can be found at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in next time for new brews with Archfiend of the Dross plus testing results with Invasion of Gobacon. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family and help support the show at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time.